Hi, I'm Miriam Williamson. During the coronavirus pandemic, I have shared my thoughts and feelings about what we are going through both individually and collectively. I hope they are helpful to you. We are pretty well into the coronavirus pandemic lockdown. And one of the things that we have been talking about is the fact that we have to reimagine our world. Uh, Nothing will be quite the same ever again, but it's up to us whether things will be better or whether things will be worse. We need to use our imaginations right now. We need to use this time of global pause, this time of forced reflection to rethink the world that brought us to this place and imagine for ourselves and plan and activate the energies that will put us on a far more sustainable and thrivable path in the 21st century. Now, one of the issues that I've been talking about quite a bit, because I and I think millions of other people as well are very, very concerned during this pandemic, and that has to do even here in the United States with the issue of hunger. We already had uh, 40 million people living in poverty in the United States, and where there is poverty, there is usually hunger. And we are already hearing reports about the fact that our food banks are overwhelmed. One of the things that I've been talking about on social media is the fact that our National Guard right now, there should be plans, there should be organization for free food delivery. We are simply going to have to do food differently. So my guest today is perfect for this conversation, a conversation that to me is twofold. Number one, something we can do now during this pandemic that can improve our lives and also very much a part of the reimagining of the world uh, that we will inhabit on the other side of the pandemic. My guest is Doug Evans. And Doug has recently published a book called The Sprout Book, Tap Into the Power of the Planet's Most Nutritious Food. So Doug, thank you so much for being uh, here with us. I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor, Marianne. And I could say very sincerely that your work has inspired me to be free and to be committed to being able to dedicate my life to work like this. So thank well, you. Well, thank you. I'm honored, and that's very generous of you because the work that you're doing right now is uh, certainly uh, beyond relevant. This is the issue, Doug. I'm one of those people, and I think that there are a lot of us. We get it, we're convinced, we understand everything should be more plant based, we understand the issue of the transition. However, some of us have not made the transition and find it harder than you might think. And I read books like yours and and I'm told, oh, it's so easy to do. It's not so easy for some of us to do. But I'll tell you, the pandemic is making a lot of us, myself included, far more aware of the urgency of the issue. You don't just talk about vegetables, although I do want to hear the whole conversation around vegetables, around green, around their their benefit, but also specifically about sprouts. So tell us a little bit of your story, how you how you came to be where you are. I know from reading your book that uh, you weren't always a vegetable guy, and uh, you certainly transitioned. And how did you get not only into the to the category of of the green uh, the green based plant based diet, but specifically to sprouts? What's your story? Well. I'm going to le- just for reasons of brevity, I'll fast forward that I grew up in New York City as a juvenile delinquent. I joined the U.S. Army as a paratrooper when I was 17 years old and ate sea rations. And then I got into graphic design and computer graphics. And my life was going really smoothly. And then my aunt got diabetes and they chopped off her feet below the ankles. Then my uncle got heart disease and died. Then my other uncle got heart disease. And then my mother died of stomach cancer. My father died of heart complications. And then my brother had the first of three strokes and a heart attack. And I thought that we were genetically cursed. I was 33 years old and I was 36 pounds overweight. And I'm a miracle. I met a woman at two o'clock in the morning in a nightclub and people are drinking and they're doing all sorts of nefarious activities. And we were having a conversation about her sister dying of leukemia, her mother sick with cancer and kind of 
just sharing, not commiserating, but really sharing. And she told me that she believed that this was lifestyle related. And I couldn't make the connection. I didn't understand. And then I probably uh, dove in very deep with her over the next two weeks and went from eating. Literally that night after I left her, I had a shish kebab in the street at three o'clock in the morning in Times Square to going from eating junk food like that to vegetarian to vegan um, and then raw vegan in a two-week period. And that was 21 years ago. So that was the beginning of my journey. And I obsessively researched and read books and spoke to doctors and read papers and looked at guidelines. And it seemed to be that everyone said, eat more vegetables, vegetables are good for you, fruits are good for you. And I had the epiphany, well, why not just eat only fruits and vegetables? And that was back in 1999. And the next 12 or 13 years, we had a business in New York City where we made that food available to people. It was called Organic Avenue. And it went from one little store that in the Lower East Side, which was like the armpit of New York um, back then in 1999, um, to having 10 stores all across New York. And that gave me a lot of experience with food safety and food sourcing and quality control, and then also connecting with a very discerning, demanding um, audience. New Yorkers will pay for things, but they will also be very demanding. And we were competing, you know, we had a store that was next door to a Starbucks in Midtown. And it was the greatest joy watching people go for a, a latte and then come in and buy a cold pressed green juice and then not go to Starbucks the next day. So that was my early entree. And then, you know, I got feedback and I was really eviscerated in the, in the media uh, about doing things that were expensive, that a $10 green juice was just not accessible to people. And there was no escape from the truth that that was an expensive product. It wasn't profitable for any juice bar to sell an organic green juice, but it was, uh, that, that was the, the view. And about two years ago, I moved to the Mojave desert east of Joshua tree to a little town that has 600 people in a hundred, in a hundred square miles. And not only is this the desert, this is a food desert. And that is when I had the epiphany about sprouts as not a garnish or an accessory to a meal, but that actually sprouts could be substance and could be sustenance and that you could actually get not only calories from there, but you could get your micronutrients and your phytonutrients and your antioxidants and your fiber and your protein all could come from sprouts. So you said two things there. Number one, you said that you had an epiphany about sprouts specifically. And secondly, you talked about the area where you're living now being a food desert. I want to hear about the epiphany, why sprouts? And also I want to hear about the food desert because um, the concern about hunger in America today has to do with the fact that so many people do live in food deserts. So first of all, talk to me about the epiphany. Why sprouts? What's so special about sprouts? Well, the, the epiphany about sprouts is literally all life or all plant life uh, per se comes from seeds that are germinated, that sprout into vegetables and to trees. And there would be no life, no, no life on the planet without sprouts. And I had sprouted the first time probably 25 years ago, wheatgrass and the sunflower seed but when I began the plant-based diet, vegan diet 21 years ago, I started to sprout more. But it was more of a novelty because I had so much ubiquitous access to vegetables. I lived near a health food store, there were farmer's markets, and there was just produce everywhere. So the, the need and necessity 
of sprouts were overlooked. And the epiphany came when I was reading the Russell Conwell essay, Acres of Diamonds. And he talked about this man who lived on a farm, who dreamed about riches, and he sold the farm, and he traveled around the world, and he lost all of his money, and in despair, he threw himself into the sea and killed himself. And years later, his neighbor, who bought the farm from him, looked into the river, little stream, and saw a tiny, shiny object. And it turned out that was a diamond. And then he looked further, and there were more diamonds and more diamonds. And it was the largest diamond find ever. And the, that's the essay of Acres of Diamonds. And I look at seeds as being, we are on acres and acres and acres of seeds. And not just the mung beans and the lentils and the alfalfa, but there are just tons of seeds from broccoli and clover and radish and cauliflower and celery to azuki and lentils and peas and hemp. And all of these seeds can be sprouted, germinated, and, and eaten. And the epiphany was that you didn't need soil to grow sprouts. You didn't need sunshine to grow sprouts. That these little seeds, the size of a poppy seed, that if you gave them water, and you created the environment for mother nature to take over, that these little seeds will grow into edible food in as little as two to three days and no longer than two weeks. Okay, so let's say someone, even while you and I are speaking, uh, the country's on lockdown, as many countries are. So you're saying that if people just get seeds, they can use water. So tell me how that works. Explain to everybody exactly what that means and exactly what they need to get. Okay. So, so th there are the seeds, and th it's, it's interesting today, there's a shortage of toilet paper, but I've yet to encounter a shortage of sprouting seeds. So the, the key um, operative words to look for in searching for these are organic sprouting seeds. And those organic sprouting seeds <clears throat> have been tested for pathogens and tested for a high germination rate. And if you get those seeds and they're relatively inexpensive and there's the economic leverage that if you were going to the health food store and buying a container of sprouts, you'd spend $5 or more plus or minus. But if you bought the seeds, it's about 50 cents worth of seeds. So that really makes it accessible for virtually anyone. And so I'll use the example of broccoli seeds. So the research came out, by the way, back in 1997, that broccoli seeds had all these anti-cancer super properties with compounds like sulforaphane. I'm going to leave out all of the superfood um, anti-cancer compound parts, and I'm just going to talk about broccoli seeds as a source of growing your own organic vegetables. So you would take two tablespoons of broccoli seeds and add them to a glass jar or a any vessel, and then you would add approximately two to three times the amount of water so that the broccoli seeds would be fully submerged in the water. And you may twirl them around so all the seeds would float that were floating would, would sink. And then you would let them sit for five hours or eight hours overnight. And then the next morning, you would strain out the extra water. And you could strain them using a sieve or a, a fine colander or what most people did in the early days. They would put a piece of cheesecloth over that jar or vessel with a rubber band and turn it 
upside down, strain out the water, add some fresh water, strain it again, and then leave the vessel upside down at a, maybe a 45 degree angle with the goal of allowing some water to enter and um, some water to exit and, and oxygen air to enter. And every day, as shy as I am, Marianne, every day I'm posting content, videos and pictures and examples and doing Instagram lives on on Instagram at Doug Evans, uh, D-O-U-G, E-V-A-N-S, and giving the examples of how to do this. But you would turn the, the jar upside down and then twice a day, so every 12 hours, you would add water and then strain the water. And literally, you will see exponential growth, that they will literally be doubling in size every 12 hours, they will grow. Initially, you'll see a little yellow and green tail, and then they will grow. And two tablespoons of broccoli seeds will turn into somewhere between four and six cups of organic vegetables on your own countertop. And all they need is the water to be rinsed in, and the little love that you give them twice a day, and you can then grow your own organic broccoli sprouts or alfalfa sprouts or mung bean sprouts. That is the basic protocol. You know, I'm not kidding when I tell you, the very last time I was at a grocery store, which was about two weeks ago, before I got scared of even going into the grocery store, I actually was looking at that section and going, I know people do things with that stuff. I don't know what to do with that stuff. So that is amazing what you're saying. What? Tell me what is in these magical seeds? What's in these sprouts that makes them so superior in terms of the, um, the anti-cancer um, and other beneficence that are different than other regular vegetables? You know, for one thing, one cup of broccoli sprouts will have approximately 16% of the recommended daily allowance of fiber. It'll have 10% of the vitamin A, but it will have up to 60% of vitamin C in one cup of broccoli sprouts, which is less than a spoonful of the seeds. And they even have two grams of protein in, in this. So if you're thinking about nutrition, broccoli sprouts, and maybe, maybe it's 35 calories. So what sprouts have is they've got more nutrition with less calories. And then if we talk about the anti-cancer compounds of particular broccoli sprouts, it's been known that the cruciferous family of vegetables contain um, these um, anti-cancer compounds. Um, so cauliflower, cabbage, kale, they all have these. Well, it turns out that broccoli seeds, when sprouted, have 30 to 50 times the amount of this compound called sulforaphane. And that sulforaphane is actually not only anti-cancer, it's the number one proven treatment, not cure, but treatment for autism. So there's this, this magic about when people start to research the benefits of plants and, and I believe, and I wrote this in my book, I believe if you took any sprout for any plant, they exist on this earth for a purpose. And if they're edible, they have these qualities. And so I became, the, the epiphany for me was like, oh my God, I'm sitting on acres of diamonds. I have access to seeds. I don't have access to a salad bar. I don't have access to 
restaurants, I don't have my, the nearest Whole Foods was an hour and 15 minutes away. But I could take my own nutrition. And, and by the way, I have access to here to fast food. I've got a Burger King, a Del Taco, a McDonald's, a 7-Eleven, 15 minutes away. But there's nothing in those um, establishments that are of the standard that I will consume. And so in the past, I thought of my eating as self-survival and other people may have looked at it as like, I'm an elitist. And with Sprouts, that's when I felt like, oh my God, if everybody can do this and we can eat, we can make food and nutrition equal for all by sharing this information. Well, with what everybody's going through with the pandemic and the lockdown, all kinds of imaginative issues um, having to do with food are helpful to all of us. Now, what about people who live in food deserts? Um, you've mentioned Whole Foods. Um, you've, you've made a good point that the sprout itself is not elitist. But unfortunately, we live in a society where it's a little bit of an elitism issue just to be able to get hold of these things. Can you get hold of, tell me where you can go to find the seeds that you're talking about. On the internet, I personally buy my seeds in this order. I buy them at sproutman.com, which is a family owned business um, out of the Berkshires where the pioneer of sprouting um, started. And they have very high quality organic seeds designed for sprouting, tested for pathogens. And this is all happening even now during the pandemic that's being delivered? Even to now, even now they are shipping. And say and that again, sproutman.com? Correct, sproutman.com. And tell me again your handle because you said you have a lot of information and um, oh. instructions on your Instagram? It, yes, and Doug what's your handle? Evans, at Doug Evans, okay. D-O-U-G-E-V-A-N-S. So you're saying that anybody can just have these seeds delivered uh, from sproutman.com. Sproutman, and I'm going to give you two other things. I would say the second place, which has been around for 20 plus years, also a family business, True Leaf Market. And it's, as you pronounce it, T-R-U-E-L-E-A-F-M-A-R-K-E-T, True Leaf Market. And they sell seeds from small containers for a few ounces, literally up until a truckload. I, I generally don't buy larger than five gallon buckets with 35 pounds of seeds in them. That's my standard order. And, and then I wouldn't say as a last resort, because I, I frequent it more often than, than not, is Amazon Prime. Yeah, and we want to stay away from that if we can. Uh, Jeff is getting. Enough. I get it. Yeah, I get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get. I. I get it. I just, you know, I. I have to really just, you know, you bring out the highest version of myself and integrity. So I. I. I may be looking at an Amazon Prime box with some shame, but it's right there in front yeah, of Yeah, and me. people work there also, so we want to support that. But we, we do want to support independent businesses wherever we can, obviously, particularly at a moment like this. Um, this is this has gone from something that was kind of cool to talk about to something that is deeply essential to talk about, the whole issue of the transition in our food. Um, it's part of uh, what I meant before about it being a different world on the other side of this. There's a lot of conversation about one of, when I was uh, campaigning last year, one of the things I felt very strongly about and talked about was um, the end to factory animal factory farming. Uh, compassion towards animals is a huge issue. You don't have to be a vegan. You don't even have to be a vegetarian to take a stand around greater compassion for animals. Um, and I, I appreciate more and more people like yourself, uh, Doug, who are telling us how to do it. Because when you talk about, you know, my own story was that, and I, I'm, it was back in, believe it or not, it was in the late 1980s. A, a friend of mine said uh, that he knew of an Indian guru 
and she was visiting Los Angeles and he wanted me to go meet with her. And I'm, listen, I'm a junkie for any spiritual teacher such as that. So, you know, okay, I'll go. And it was an apartment in Beverly Hills. And I went there and I, it was a woman. And from the moment that we began to speak, and I thought she was going to be spouting all this spiritual wisdom. And from the moment that she began to speak, all she was telling me was that I must stop eating meat and that I must not eat animals. And I was getting increasingly annoyed because I had not come there for a conversation about vegetarianism. I had not come there to hear her tell me that I must not eat meat. And she just kept on. And it was all she would talk about. All she would talk about was not eating animals. I don't know how long I stayed there, but I left pretty miffed. The next conscious thought I had, I was standing in my kitchen. What happened? Uh huh. Can. Uh huh. Are you there? Okay. So I was very annoyed at this woman because I had not uh, gone to see her in order to hear her give me a lecture about vegetarianism and not eating meat. She kept going. That's all she would talk about. I remember leaving miffed. And the next conscious thought I had, I was standing at my sink or standing in my kitchen anyway, in West Hollywood. And I had in my hands a bucket of Kentucky Colonel fried chicken. I had no conscious memory of even going there. And I, even though I ate meat, I wasn't the type of person who goes to Kentucky Colonel fried chicken and buys a bucket. That just wasn't my thing. And I was shocked. How had this happened? And then I had this, this thought, it's the last you'll ever eat of this. And she had done something to me. She had put something in me. She had transmitted something. She had, she had zapped me. And I was delivered through this just shakti of this woman. And I was, as you describe in your book, I was lifted. And I couldn't even bear the thought of eating an animal. And I would look at people with, with meat on their plates like how how it was it was strange but it not only was strange because she had zapped me this all came from that session with her but i was clearer and lighter i couldn't believe the difference it made about a month later my then boyfriend and i were at a restaurant in new york city i don't know if it was a month later or two months later but i fainted and i was in the hospital and they had to put whatever they had to put intravenous because she had zapped me, but I had not learned how to do it. All I knew was that I couldn't touch meat. And when I would go to, then I went to my Chinese medical doctor and I went to my other holistic doctor in, in, in Los Angeles when I got back. And much to my disappointment now, they said, you know, Marianne, we really appreciate that you want to be a vegetarian, but your ancestry, blah, 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 it's just not for your body. And I have never been able to get back. So I... I've had many friends. Kathy Freston is a good friend. Um, I've had people yelling at me, what kind of spiritual teacher are you? Um, but, you know, I had a meal once with the Dalai Lama and he was eating beef. So um, I, I don't necessarily buy into that. But I do buy into the fact that this is better for the planet. Um, and I know how I felt. And so I appreciate people like yourself, Doug, who give us the kind of information. Like I said, I pass those seeds in grocery stores and I go, I know people do stuff with it. I don't know what to do with that stuff. So I very much enjoyed your book and I, and I very much appreciate that you've given this, um, con this information that you've given, not only here to me, but to all of the people who are listening. And I appreciate so much the work that you're doing. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the book or about the information in the book or anything like that that you'd like people to know? Sure. 
Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, Marianne. Um, it's interesting because for the book, since I don't have, um, since I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not a nutritionist, I thought it was responsible for me to speak to dietitians and medical doctors. And I spoke to doc, I interviewed for the book, Dr. Dean Ornish, who no surprise, he's all plant-based and Dr. Joel Kahn, he's plant-based. But then I spoke to Dr. Mark Hyman, who practices functional medicine, who's not plant-based. And Dr. Josh Axe, who is a proponent of the ketogenic diet. And um, a bunch of wide ranging people. And they had two things in common. Number one, they all had an earnest desire to help people. Like they really, you could feel it in, in, in your core that you were speaking to someone who wanted to help people. And number two, they loved sprouts. They all loved sprouts. It was a common theme. They all loved sprouts. So I somewhat took my militant um, plant-based vegan hat off and I put on my compassionate hat about equality. And in my interview with, with Dr. Dean Ornish, he talked about many years ago, he was consulting to the CEO of McDonald's and advised them to put salad on the menu. And it was $5.99 and no one bought it because they could get many more calories for 99 cents on a Big Mac. And that's where I thought about how can we make this more accessible? And in the quasi tra tragedy, and, and we talk about, um, and I don't know, I haven't figured out how we can have humane slaughter. I don't really get that because we're slaughtering someone something that does not want to die. But I don't want to go there, right? I don't, I don't want to go there. But when they talk about free range and, and grass fed, that's five times the cost of energy and resources and land. And they're letting the, 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 the cow live longer. So it's actually using even more resources um, than yeah, yeah. One, every an acre, 100 acres every second so that we can do this. But so when I look at the, the, the aspect of not having free range or grass fed beef, and I'm saying, it, how do I be on par? How can I set an example? And if, if people are hungry and they want to be safe, they can actually choose to add sprouts to their diet. And in, in the two year period, I set up a lab in Wonder Valley, California, where I tried and tested sprouting techniques with jars, with trays, with soil, and with unbleached paper towels, with unglazed terracotta um, pots and, and and drip trays. And I publish that all in my book because there's no one thing for everybody. And the one example I wanted to give, because even like on the plant-based diet and lentils, which are an important staple of many cuisines around the world, lentils are sproutable and edible in two to three days. And it's fairly foolproof because you're just adding water and then the tail will grow and they're hearty, they're crunchy, they're satisfying. They don't have a lot of taste, but you can use herbs and spices to flavor all you want. And so in my book, I hired a professional chef and recipe developer to co-create with me 40 recipes so people can use their art of cooking and adding sprouts into their diet. 
And the criteria that we set for the recipes would be they would be 100% plant-based. They would be all raw plant-based, so alive, uncooked. And 50% of the recipes would contain sprouts. But if I go back to the lentils, when you sprout lentils, they have twice the antioxidant content of unsprouted lentils because you're, you're activating the life force within them. And then lentils normally have an anti-nutrient in them, but when they're sprouted, that anti-nutrient gets neutralized and more vitamins and minerals get absorbed. And as a result, things like vitamin C increases 300 to 400% in a sprouted lentil versus a regular lentil. Okay, everybody, you heard it here. While Doug was speaking, I looked on the sproutman.com website. You have uh, Doug Evans' book called The Sprout Book. You have at Doug Evans on Instagram. Uh, None of us have to be reminded that during this period of time, uh, nothing really could be more important than that we get more enlightened about food, uh, what we can eat, what is medicinal, what is helpful, what is healthy, what helps to build the immune system, what is far cheaper. And also, as I think uh, both Doug and I made clear, this is the kind of change that the whole planet is going to need to make, or at least lean into that direction, as my friend Kathy Freston would say. Doug, thank you very, very much for what you've contributed to all of us. I can't think of a, I know on a commercial level, uh, your book coming out during this pandemic is probably not the best thing, but in terms of its help to the planet and to all all of us who have listened to you and are reading the book, it couldn't be a more perfect time. So thank you very, very much for the work that you've done and that you were doing. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your instruction. And I wish you and all of us the very, very best. To all of you who are listening, this is Marianne Williamson. I've been speaking with Doug Evans. His book is called The Sprout Book. And if you're anything like me, you're going to be eating a lot of sprouts in the coming weeks. All my best. Much love. On the Sofa is produced by Mike Burns. 